Okay, here we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Our next presenter is the Vice President of Diversity, Partnership, Strategy, and Engagement at Twitter. She is also the founder of the award-winning Dignity and Respect Campaign, which has helped organizations create more inclusive work environments. Please join me in welcoming Candy Castleberry Singleton to discuss diversity and AI. Candy. Thank you for having uh, Kim, and I am also proud. Am I echoing? Okay. I'm also a, a proud uh, member of the board of Girls in Tech. So I would say that is my first role today, more so than uh, my role uh, at Twitter. Uh, I would also add that I have been at this work for now over 15 years. Uh, and in doing so, um, I will tell you the thing that keeps me up at night uh, on a regular day, uh, although we're not in regular times, uh, is this conversation about diversity and AI. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, on the next slide, um, I am going to suggest that uh, I hope that something I say today encourages you, inspires you, reminds you to ensure that as we are talking about machine learning and AI algorithms, uh, that every one of these conversations should include AI going forward. I will tell you that most of what I think about um, is that much of this work is happening and without champions like you on this call today and without people who are insisting that we are thinking about diversity, that it can be in some cases the same amount of effort that we have put into this work over the years and just talking about the workforce. So if you look on the next slide, I give an illustration that I think diversity is at the intersection, right, of workforce and culture and artificial intelligence. The difference is if you think about the impact and how long it has taken us to even get to a conversation where we can talk about pay equity, that we can talk about gender and racial equity in workplaces, and many people have been working on this long before me, in addition to long before me, long before the generations of people who are even on this call. And to some degree, I would say the progress is very much like the slow train. If we think about how long it has taken us to get to the place where we are, with still so much work to do in diversity and inclusion, I will tell you that artificial intelligence will surpass that in literally less time. And, and the point that I make with this is that if it took us this long on the slow train to get where we are, to convince people to prioritize diversity and inclusion as a way that we work in our organizations, not just in the way that we think about workforce, but the culture, the way we build products, the way that we market, the way that we think about who we include, who we cast, who is going to be a part of the patient care team, who is going to be a part of the team that is out advertising the products that we sell. Think about how much time it took for us to get to the place today. And each of us know how much work there still is to be done wherever we sit, wherever we work, uh, wherever we attend school in the world. And yet at the same time, artificial intelligence will automatically surpass that work. And what I mean by that is that the, the speed in which artificial intelligence will replace the actual human work processes is already begun. And if we acknowledge that we still have work to do in workplace and culture, then we must also acknowledge that artificial intelligence is also programmed by the very same people who still have, in some cases, to still be convinced that diversity is important in workplace and culture. And yet they're building machines and algorithms in this very moment to replace those people with the same aspects or thinking that they have about diversity. On the next slide, um, I emphasize the fact that the world is run by people and machines. I think we all know this. A book that I would highly recommend, if you haven't already heard of it, is a book called The Algorithms of Oppression. Uh, and one of the things that Professor Noble talks about in this book is that there is literally technological redlining, the same redlining that we may have heard about uh, that happens for Black, Latinx, and women in workplaces, uh, in communities, in the way that perhaps they were having access to real estate. In many cases, the lack of diversity that exists in technology, in the workforce, 
uh, in the building of technology is also reflected in the algorithms that ultimately will replace humans. Now today, this is already happening. On the next slide, I emphasize the fact that people, it takes as many people on the next slide, on, it takes as many people uh, to do the work, this many people as an example, uh, to do the work of perhaps one machine. And, and today, uh, in if let's think of a simple process like recruiting. So imagine that all of these people were recruiters. Each of them individually is making a decision about perhaps who actually gets the interview. Perhaps they're making a decision about who is the person who is going to be uh, moving from this part of a process to another one. As an individual, we're making decisions. Many people have already moved from a sourcing strategy that is not people, but a machine. And in fact, that machine is then programmed to say, here are the characteristics or here are the key words that we would be looking for as an example in a candidate. And that machine is programmed by the same people, maybe not obviously recruiters, but engineering with the same mindsets perhaps. And those mindsets now are programmed into machines. So if the people, who are programming the machines still have bias, then the machines themselves will not just impact the one-on-one -on -one that an individual person, but it will scale to impact a number of people exponentially. When I was teaching a class at Carnegie Mellon for about five years, my role in teaching that class was not to teach them to be diversity practitioners, but to think about the role that they play in everyday life. I also ask you to consider this. Their capstone project wasn't, what did I learn about diversity? The capstone project was, what can I do differently to ensure that the outcomes have a positive impact on a different demographic group? And in fact, they had to build process or tools or algorithms or uh, products or pro um, uh, programming that, that actually said, here is a positive outcome intentionally for three different, different demographic groups. Now, I will tell you the reason that I think the diversity has um, had challenges as it relates to people. Because as on the next slide, uh, we all have bias. Uh, we all have bias in some way. And whether that is our bias is a blind spot that we have because of perhaps where we've grown up, from a geographic perspective, from a cultural lens, from an economic lens, from a gender, gender identity, there is impossible for one human to really have the ability, quite frankly, to understand every single person in the world. What I can tell you that I do believe is that most people don't come to work and say, let me, let my bias have a negative impact on people. But what I can also tell you that I don't believe is that people come to work every day and say, let me ensure that my bias does not have a negative impact on people. So we don't come to work saying, let me make it have a in bias, but we don't come to work and say, what can I do to prevent it? And that's the ask that I would have of each of you. It's the ask that I've had of students. It's the ask that I had of every single person that I've worked with. When you start to think about the impact that you can have on a person because of your own bias, particularly in a world like today, where in many cases it's still even uncomfortable to ask the questions about another person. Sometimes without asking those questions and without a commitment to ensuring that our bias isn't being embedded in our work product, sometimes it just happens. On the next slide, I talk about this, that if in fact we agree, and I hope we do, that we all have some sort of bias, in some cases, some sort of privilege, that us programming machines and code or work processes every day, that those biases then become embedded. And like the difference between the car that we're moving literally like a slow train, the amount of time that it took to make the progress that we had, that bias that's embedded inside of machine and coding and work processes that becomes automated will accelerate far, it will accelerate faster than quite frankly we were ever able to do as humans. So the work that we have to do is to ensure that we start to think about the impact that diversity and bias has on every single thing that we do. On the next slide, 
um, I would emphasize this, that uh, <laughs> this is a little cartoon that says, you know, this is machine learning system, right? This is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect all the answers on the other side. And then someone asks, well, what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just keep starting up until it starts looking right. Well, we know, at least we hope, that the engineers in our respective organizations, and you obviously aren't going to take it uh, to the place where you're like, just stir it up until it looks right. But for the most part, the person who's using the system has no idea whether it's right. So to some degree, we're trusting organizations and we're trusting you that you will do the right thing as it relates to algorithms and data. Next slide. So what I can also say is that uh, this is not just clearly my opinion uh, from well-documented uh, gender bias and racial bias that exists uh, in humans executed day to day. It can also be then programmed into machines and then you get results like this. Now, I don't have to you know, go and belabor each of these. You can Google uh, bias and, uh, and algorithms and you'll find all kinds of stories. But these are some of the ones that you may have heard of. Uh, one is about the research and how it talks about that skin types, um, that there are more data sets uh, for white males than there are for black people. And therefore, in some cases, they are misidentified. Uh, you may have also heard the apple cart story, right? Same data going in, uh, a man and a woman having the same or similar credit scores, uh, similar income, and somehow the female is getting less credit with the same information that was supplied by a male. Now, I am sure Apple didn't say, hey, let's figure out how we can do this in a way that creates a problem, but unfortunately, these are sometimes the results. And I think we've all had this experience, right? Where you go into a restroom and you put your hand under the soap dispenser. And because obviously the soap dispenser is looking for an image, often an image that doesn't look like a black hand, in some cases, uh, as documented in this story, uh, people with darker skin are having a challenge uh, that's different than people with lighter skin and actually getting the soap dispenser to work. And then the story about Amazon uh, and they're scrapping their AI tool because it showed bias against women. So we know that this is real. So what's next? On the next slide, uh, I would tell you that it's not just the programmers, right? That is related to machine learning. Machines learn from all of us. In fact, we're all providing some kind of data just in our day-to-day -day interactions on social media um, and the way that we interact uh, using tools and apps. So on the next slide, uh, I think of a couple of things. One is uh, Facebook tags, uh, clearly uh, an algorithm um, that has become so smart. Uh, if you've been using Facebook for any period of time, there was a time when you actually had to uh, if someone tagged you, you would get a notification to accept. Now Facebook is actually smart enough that it will actually ask you, is this you? And you log on to Facebook and there you'll see this list of images from pic pictures that people have posted someplace in the universe of Facebook. And it'll say, would you like to tag yourself in this picture? So it has moved from the ability to a person tagging you to now it recognizes your face in a way that it'll ask you yourself. Uh, Google Photos. Um, I think about uh, one of my sisters who uh, is not very interested at all, quite frankly, in social media. Um, and although she does post some things, what she doesn't know is my ability or your ability to tell people about her. So as an example, one of the things that um, I sadly have way more photos than my iPhone can handle. I have literally like 60,000 photos on my iPhone. And I back up my photos on Google Photos. Um, and so sometimes I will go to my parents' house and I'll see a really nice picture that I've not seen before and I'll take a picture of that picture. And so of course it uploads to go Google Photos. So one day I am going into Google, Google Photos, and it shows me a picture of this sister who has no intention on being on social media, 
as a small child. And it shows me a picture of, of her in current times. And Google says, is this her? I have to tell you that if it was me, I would have probably said, sure, that's me, because obviously it already has 60,000 photos. It probably knows. But my sister is now being identified through facial recognition technology because of something I'm doing. And by simply programming that to say, yes, I'm and that it is her, it is actually training it to recognize my sister's photo. And she doesn't even know I'm participating. Anyway, all of these things are real. We're all participating in them in so many ways. And what I would also add uh, is that whether it's a reward program where you know, you're telling people what you're buying, uh, whether it, it's gathering data uh, from the games that you play, apps that include health, shopping, credit cards, our information is out in the world. Now, it can be used for good. So let's go to the next slide. So AI can be used for good on the next slide. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Hi, how are you? We're just about ready to wrap up here. Okay, I got a couple more slides. So uh, AI can be used for good. Um, and uh, in the same way, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, AI can, you, you can use automation. So that same Facebook technology um, that I talked about earlier um, also allowed me to go to Google Photos and Facebook, and one of my friends sadly passed away. And I was actually able to take all of his images and create a video. So sometimes it can be used for good. On the next slide, I will tell you that it could also be not so good. Next slide. So it can also create targeted information that perhaps you don't want. I think sometimes we all get this information. It's like too many advertising. Um, and the two things I would recommend from this slide and the amount of time that we have are two things you should watch. One is the Black Mirror episode called Nosedive to understand how it can affect us. The second thing is to understand uh, the impact of AI and all of this data that's gathered about each of us on elections and society. I would recommend watching The Great Hack. And then finally, Diversity should be a part of every conversation, and why? Because one, we all have bias. Two, that bias is now programmed into artificial intelligence algorithms and every single thing we do. And three, that algorithms actually have a greater impact on society than one human because an algorithm, the machine, it actually can impact exponentially more people. And my hope for you is that something that I've said in this conversation today will inspire you to do a double click one, on understanding how your organization and how you are using this uh, information and data to impact the world and making sure that the things that you're doing, the things that you're saying, the things that you're building, the things that you're influencing, ensure that diversity is a part of that conversation. And please include AI. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candy. We really appreciate you being here. This session has now come to a close. Join us in a few moments for our next session.